Thank you. That's great. That was really good. I liked um, my takeaway was I liked how you said um, get to know your partner's script and their experiences with money, even as from childhood. Mm -hmm. Because that will really give you an insight into, yeah, what what their fears might be. It kind of reminded me a little bit of an episode we did a, a little while ago about the primal questions, but just kind of getting to know like what, what fears or excitement your um, partner might have about money. That it does. I, I know growing up with two parents who were both savers and I just learned to save. And my dad was a school teacher. We didn't make a lot of money. We didn't realize it. Right. And we had six kids and we just, did what we did a lot of camping and a lot of things that didn't require a lot of money, but I, I sure appreciate my parents instilling that the importance of, of money and saving. Although, you know, to an extreme amount of it, because when we were first married, um, there was talk about the slush funds. We didn't make a whole lot. I can't remember. It was maybe like $40 or something, you know, my wife and just, Hey, whatever you want, you go do it. And I, mine was like less, which I was fine with. Mine was like $20 or something, but it got to be like three or four months down the road. And I just had, I had 20, 40, 60, because I never wanted to spend my money. My slush fund would just accumulate in my my wallet because I, I didn't want to spend it on anything. So maybe I was too, especially early on, it was like, no, you know, this is not a need. And it was a little bit extreme because of, of that, maybe in that environment and that spillover. So now I think that we both uh, are more on the same page. Again, over time, it takes some time to develop that, that communication and then to know each other and how we, how we were raised and how it affects our our finances and really what money means to each of us. And it changes, doesn't it? Through the season of life, through of marriage. I think it's probably your point. Yeah, it does. I was a lot uh, sort of tighter early on as well. And then this spontaneous money personality that I sort of gravitated to or has come later, later in life. And, I, you know, watch out because when Delta has cheap airfare, I'm like... <laughs> We're buying some tickets. We could go there. <laughs> go there for half price. Oh, yeah. Nice. It, yeah. Mm-hmm. It, things definitely do change with the time and the season in life. I have another question I, I've got I to ask. I, I could have asked um, yeah. on the show, but yeah. Amanda, um, do you find with the research and the couples that no matter how much a, cup, uh, a couple makes, as far as their, their bottom line, their annual income, that we just spend what we earn? You know, it feels like, I get an increase, I get a raise or something, or I, I get my, we just tend to always, no matter our income goes up and our spending just kind of follows it without us even like consciously thinking about it. Have you f- found that, I don't know, your own relationship or seen that with couples, maybe you're making 20,000 and now I'm making 60 and I'm making 150. We just always tend to spend what we make. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, we see, we see that a lot. And you know, the fun caveat to the research there is for a long, long time, the research would say that about $80,000 adjusted for inflation. So around eighty eighty five thousand dollars $85,000, if you made more than that, there's no real increased level of happiness after that, because that was about the number that researchers said would covered your needs, a little, some of your wants. And, and then after, and you're to, to your point that you spend what you make, you just spend what you make anyway. So after about that 80, 85,000 threshold, we're not really, happier with more money until recently <laughs> oh really that research, this is kind of new this is new the research says sort of flip-flopped to say um actually you know and it's sort of it, it, it's all relative a bit but as of late there have been studies to come out and say actually there there is sort of an increased level of happiness when when we pass a threshold and we're able when more money and, and the way we manage that money to our interest and our joy. Right. But when, when, when we just continue with indebtedness or other things that, so there were some caveats there with that, but I, I love, I love that topic because we can be happy or unhappy on any income. You name it, you can be happy or unhappy on any income. So then what does that tell us? Simple money decisions like living within your means, trust and communication maybe really are the key to happiness with money, not not how much you're making. That um, I was going to ask if there's any um, truth to the old adage, more money, more problems. But, uh, <laughs> I, I think you nailed it. Oh, that's there. A, a popular money saying, isn't it? Is it? Yeah. I was going to ask... Um, 
as for like younger couples, I kind of wish that somebody would have told me this, but I started, you know, a couple years ago. Uh, do you have any like um, recommendations if, if people should invest in an IRA or maybe like mutual index dividend funds or anything like that? Oh, sure. You know, um, we talk about this quite a bit, especially as it relates to women and money. Uh, the recommendation we give generally across the board that I feel comfortable sharing without a CPA certification license or anything like that, right, is the the Roth IRA, sort of the name of the game earlier on, the better. But at any point, um, Roth IRA dollars go in, you already paid taxes on the money that's invested. So when you pull out the earnings, you're not paying taxes again. So part of the tax sheltered strategy for retirement would include a Roth IRA. Why we talk about it, particularly with women, um, is that women outlive men in, in statistically across women are living longer. So uh, oftentimes, though, we find that women aren't the ones that have the retirement accounts in their names for what for many reasons. And if um, if they do, oftentimes they have them for a period of time and then they maybe take a break from the workforce and they may or may not return. If they do return, they've lost out on some years of earning and and interest in things. And so uh, it's really nice to take stock of where are our retirement accounts and whose names are they in? And uh, and for women particularly, having your, your own name on, your, on a retirement account, which it's an individual retirement account, right? An IRA, that's what it stands for. So, so if, and I mean this in the best way, if your account, if your retirement strategy has your spouse's entire, their entire in their entirety in your spouse's name that to please consider opening in your own name uh, and a Roth IRA is where I would tell people to start. Okay. So two questions for, um, can you have a beneficiary on an yes. Roth IRA? Mm -hmm. Yes. And for, for audience members who might be not, not familiar, how does that, how does a Roth IRA work? Does it work like, um, does it pay out monthly or weekly, or is it like an income somebody can live on, or do they just take out one lump sum? How there's a couple work? of options. So, you know, there's options for a lump sum. There's options for monthly payouts. And the age at which you do that and the amount of, uh, you know, you can take it out early on. You'll pay penalty for, for doing that. Um, but it is very, it is a pretty flexible in investment vehicle in that regard because there are options there based on what, what you need in your situation. Um, and then obviously I'm not one to say the not, I, I'm not one to say this is the absolute best and only way to do something because personal finance is personal. But I will say that across the board, a Roth IRA would work for everyone. It would be. It would be a smart money decision, regardless of your your money. Can you, um, so I have a couple different uh, accounts and a diversified um, portfolio, but I'm mainly into like dividend stocks and oh, uh, sure. dividend mutual funds, just because I'm like, oh, I think it's a great idea. I want to know what the difference would be for me, though. Like, I'm investing so that when my wife and I get old enough and we want to retire that we'll just have a regular steady income coming in and we won't have to burden our children or anything like that. And maybe we can even leave it to them when we pass. Yeah. But what's the difference between something like my strategy or a Roth IRA? Cause I hear a lot of people recommend those and I don't really know a lot about Roth IRAs. Well, the Roth is money that, you know, there's a certain amount of money. There are limits on how much you can put into a Roth annually. Those limits have increased lately, but there is a limit. So what you're doing, there's no limit to the type of investing that you're discussing. And and the more you have in, the more dividends you make, right? A Roth, you can max out every year. And, and then there's a tax strategy there with a Roth, right? Because ideally, the, the amount of tax that you're paying younger in life and this lower than what you're, you would pay uh, later in life. So so the tax part of it comes into play pretty heavily. But the, the Roth, you're basically then taking that investment out and draining that investment as you spend it down, right? So this is the account that Liz is going to use to travel mm -hmm. till it's gone. This mm -hmm. is her strategy here, right? Mm -hmm. That's sort of the, that what is my strategy. Sort of what, uh, Roth IRA or how it's different. Yeah. Yeah. And what a great way to use that. I can't, I can't think of anything better there. I just love to use mine entirely for travel. 
when that time comes. <laughs> And not wait till that time to travel now. Sure. To just sure. You never clear. know, right? It's hard to just keep putting things yeah. off, too, isn't it? Life is so uncertain. Yeah. Well, this has been helpful. So fun. Last Thank question, you. if you don't mind. I just can you just brag a little bit about how this adoption, how did this baby come to find you, this lucky baby? How did this come? Do you mind? Well, I'll, yeah, it's a sweet story because my friend Dave Schramm texts me and says, I need, I need a last minute MC. I need a last minute MC for tonight's event. Do you remember this day? I'm like, call him. And I say, Dave, I'm calling you because I want you to know I would be there. I would be there in a heartbeat, but I am in the hospital holding a three day old baby girl. <laughs> so, so we got a phone call, uh, on, February 9th, which is our anniversary. Can you believe it? No kidding. No kidding. And baby had been born on the 7th of February and birth mom had chose, chose to place and had chosen, wanted to meet with us. And we got a call that said, can you come to meet later today? And we did. And so it was like 24 hour baby. And I highly recommend it. It was so lovely. It was oh, so my goodness. Everything else just faded to the background and and I'll never forget bringing my, uh, you know, my son, my five-year-old, six-year-old in to meet here. And the first time that they met and just that feeling of connection that we just felt like. Oh, this, gosh. Was, this is our this, baby. She was oh, meant to be our baby. We were just oh, so over just the right. So pickle pink for you. I love adoption. Yeah. Very near and dear to my heart. Thank so you. Great. Love it. Oh, love it. Love it. You're lovely. Amanda. Uh, thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks. You're the best. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, do us a favor and take a few minutes to subscribe to our podcast and the Utah Marriage Commission YouTube channel, where you can watch this and every episode of the show. When you hit the like button and leave a comment, your feedback helps us improve the show. And don't forget to share this episode with a friend. You can also follow and connect with us on Instagram at Stronger Marriage Life and on Facebook at Stronger Marriage. Be sure to share with us what topics you want us to explore or what you loved about today's episode. If you want even more resources to improve your relationship connection, visit our website at strongermarriage.org where you'll find free workshops, webinars, relationship surveys, and more. Each episode of Stronger Marriage Connection is hosted and sponsored by the Utah Marriage Commission at Utah State University. And finally, a big thanks to our producers Rex Polanis and Alexis Alcott and the team at Utah State University. And you, our audience, you make this show possible. The opinions, findings, conclusions, and recommendations expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of the Utah Marriage Commission.